The subject of this video is substitution nucleophilic first order SN1 type reactions. And the key thing to keep in mind for an SN1 type reaction is that the leaving group is just going to leave. But when I draw out the generic reaction for this process, what you'll see is something that should look nearly identical to the SN2 reaction that we diagrammed out earlier. There are going to be some differences. All of those differences are going to be in the rate and the reaction coordinate diagram, therefore the mechanism of the reaction. But the big picture ideas remain the same. You have a nucleophile, you have a substrate. That substrate has to have a leaving group on it. At some point in that reaction, the leaving group has to leave. So that is a key mechanistic step. And you're going to create the new product where the nucleophile has now taken the place of the leaving group. That's the substitution parts and the leaving group ends up just plain leaving. Both reactions depend on a nucleophile, although in subtly different ways. In the SN2 reaction, the nucleophile actually had to come in and attack the substrate in order to cause the leaving group to leave. So one of the main differences between SN1 and SN2 is going to be the order of operations in the mechanism. But they both involve the exact same pieces. Because of the way the mechanism works, the substrate is going to be different for each one, but that's not going to show up with this sort of generic thing. They both need to have a good leaving group. There are going to be some subtleties in the nucleophile. The solvents that prefer each are going to be different, and again, that's going to be tied to the mechanism. But if there's a single idea that you most need to keep in mind, it is that an SN2 reaction involves a collision between the nucleophile and the substrate with the leaving group on it, and so that collision is what drives the reaction, whereas an SN1 reaction just has the substrate with the leaving group on it, and the leaving group leaves first. And that is the key image to keep in mind. For an SN2 type mechanism, again, because you have a collision in the slow step between the nucleophile and the substrate with the leaving group on it, then the more nucleophile you have, the faster that reaction goes, and the more substrate you have, the more likely a collision between those two. And so the rate of the reaction depends on some rate constant, which basically amounts to are the orientation of the two molecules correct, times the concentration of the nucleophile. The more nucleophile you have, the faster this goes, times the concentration of the substrate with the leaving group. The more of that you have, the faster this goes. And again, it's because a collision is involved in that slow step. And then, because the nucleophile has to attack simultaneous with the leaving group leaving, the reaction coordinate diagram for an SN2 reaction is one single hump. So a one hump camel, there are no pauses along the way. Instead, it just keeps on going. So there's one transition state, and that's it. An SN1 reaction is different in that the rate of the reaction is only going to depend on the concentration of the substrate with the leaving group bound. Because what happens in the SN1 reaction is that substrate just simply decomposes on its own. Later, separately, the nucleophile comes in and attacks, but that happens in a fast step. So the slow step for the reaction is substrate decomposing, which means that this rate will depend only on the amount of substrate that you have. It also means that the reaction coordinate diagram for this is going to show that first the substrate decomposes, which has you hang out at some intermediate for a while, and then that proceeds down to products. And so the main difference is that you're going to have a carbocation intermediate at that stage, and this will end up being a two hump camel, and each of those humps has potentially a transition state. And so the core ideas that are different in an SN1 reaction and an SN2 reaction are that the SN1 depends on substrate plus leaving group as it just decomposes, whereas SN2 depends on both the nucleophile and the substrate with the leaving group at the same time because they have to collide. And everything in an SN2 reaction happens simultaneously, whereas in an SN1 reaction, the leaving group leaves first and then other stuff happens. Just to illustrate some of the main differences between SN1 and SN2, I've chosen to use a tertiary substrate. In other words, the carbon that the leaving group is bound to contains bonds to three other carbons. And I've also decided to make this chiral. Tertiary substrate is important because an SN2 reaction cannot take place on a tertiary substrate. Okay, so let's walk through the mechanism of this reaction. First things first, what happens is that the leaving group leaves. This is in fact the slow step for this reaction. And what that does is then create a equilibrium step here. So I had a neutral substrate originally, and I had an iodide with three electron pairs on it. Once that bond has become a fourth lone pair, it is no longer connected, and so the I is floating around as I minus with four lone pairs on it, which means that for this to end up neutral overall, there has to be a plus left behind. So the position where the iodide was bound now lacks for a fourth pair of electrons, so this carbon contains a plus charge and lacks an octet. As you can imagine, that means it's a relatively unstable intermediate. It's a carbocation, and there's a plus there. But what you may not have considered is this was an sp3 hybridized carbon to begin with, and now that the iodide has left, this is an sp2 hybridized carbon with an empty p orbital, and that's why it is a plus. There's an empty p orbital. But because 
because it is sp2, that also means it's trigonal planar. This was tetrahedral, meaning it had four different directions in space. This is trigonal planar. It only has three directions, and now it is flat. In other words, the stereochemical information that was present here is now gone. The iodide is, of course, priority one. The isopropyl part is priority two. The ethyl group is priority three, and the methyl is priority four. This then was S to begin with. But now that the iodide has left, the carbocation is formed, there is no stereochemical information remaining. Okay, so now we're going to need to do some other future step in order to continue on to products. And let me just simply point out here, the most likely single step that happens at this stage is that the iodide would go ahead and recombine in order to form the original substrate. But keep in mind, now that the iodide has left at first, what that creates is that planar intermediate, which means it could be attacked from top or bottom. So the iodide has left, which means when it goes back in, it may not necessarily be S. It may be, in fact, the racemic mixture that you get out, some S and some R. 50-50 if it was racemic. On the other hand, the iodide has broken away and is sitting right above where it was before, so the most likely thing that it does is recombine. So it's more likely it goes back to the way it was. It's only when the two get far enough separated from each other that anything else could happen. So the iodide reforming to go back to where it was is more likely to lead to S than R, just because they haven't yet separated that far. And again, the reason why they'd recombine is because the iodide is a minus, the cation is a plus, and they'd be attracted to each other. So that would explain what would be going on there. Now, of course, that's boring. It leads back to where you came, possibly having destroyed some information. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is you recognize that the sodium is almost certainly existing as sodium plus, not actually bound to the chloride, but just kind of floating nearby. And therefore, the chloride is actually chloride minus, which means that it has four lone pairs of its own and is a pretty good nucleophile. Not as good as iodide, but still pretty good. So then this could come in and attack instead of the iodide. And what that would do then is create two new products. And the reason why you get two new products is that the chloride could attack from either the top or the bottom evenly because this is a flat cation. So it could either attack from the camera or from me. And that would lead to two different products. You would either get the chloride back or the chloride toward the camera. In other words, you're generating both the S chloride and the R chloride, and there really is no preference between the two possibilities because you're attacking a planar intermediate, which means, again, you can generate both of them in a 50-50 mix. And what this really shows is that a substitution nucleophilic first order reaction can take place on a tertiary substrate, unlike an SN2, and the stereochemical information is racemized during the course of the reaction. And so what you end up doing is losing any stereochemical information. In an SN2 reaction, you explicitly invert because everything happens at the same time. But in an SN1 reaction, because you explicitly go through a planar carbocation intermediate, then any stereochemical information you had before is now gone. The SN1 reaction destroys that stereochemical information. And now that I've diagrammed out the specific mechanism for this reaction, it's now possible to talk about the specific reaction coordinate diagram you'd obtain for this mechanism. And so then the key idea is that the initial iodide plus, of course, the sodium chloride, not pictured, are the energy of the starting materials here. And then you go over some transition state because it's hard. It, it takes energy to have the iodide leave. But once it's left, you have created a carbocation. And that carbocation is stable enough that it exists for some lifetime. This is unlike the SN2 where you just simply pass through the transition state and on. Here, you pass through to a relatively stable well, which is the carbocation itself. Having said that, it can then be attacked by a new chloride, pass through another transition state, and lead on to products. And again, I'm diagramming this out as though this is lower in energy so that you have an explanation for why this happens. But the key feature to keep in mind is an SN1 reaction will always involve a actual carbocation intermediate. You need to have a carbocation, and this needs to happen in two steps. First, the leaving group leaves, destroying your stereochemical information, creating the opportunity for racemization. Then the nucleophile attacks, then you have the new product. The only real difference between substitution nucleophilic second order and first order is what mechanism they go by. In an SN2, there's a collision. All of the reaction happens in one step. In an SN1, it decomposes first. Separately, something comes in later. That's the difference.